So, Rajesh, I'm going to stop here and uh, I will let you share your presentation and then uh, start your presentation. Thank you very much again for uh, finding time to present. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Reddy, uh, for a very generous introduction. Uh, like I've based on the achievements that you have, I've not seen a humble person more than you. Like you are, you are more approachable than anyone I've seen. <laughs> so, so, and, uh, and I, I, I know you since your book, uh, which we read, which I read in grad school with Professor Rajdi Sarma. Uh, so that's since then, uh, like, uh, we met, we have, we have, I've been looking at your work. So it, you are basically a role model for us. Uh, so, okay. Uh, so we'll uh, get started. Uh, uh, with this uh, topic, uh, any again, any question, please uh, put it on uh, uh, in your uh, in the chat box. Uh, we will uh, get the questions towards the end, and also please keep your uh, microphone uh, muted so that we don't uh, get disturbed. So, as Professor Reddy mentioned, and as you saw in the flyer, the topic is looking at the resource recovery and uh, circular economy approaches in waste management. So. Uh, as uh, uh, like we, before I get into uh, the topic, I usually show these two slides and I think some of my students who are in the audience, uh, probably they have seen it n number of times, but uh, I, I will show this anyway, <laughs> uh, because this actually helps me to put things in big perspective. See, if you look at uh, uh, the age of this earth, because see, we are talking about this resource recovery, we talk about circular economy, we talk about sustainable engineering, we talk about environmental risk assessment, uh, like human health impact, in, uh, have impact on environment. All of this, if you look at it in a big picture, is essentially to try to keep this, our home, which is this mother earth, as clean as possible so that our future generation can survive on this planet. They should also thrive, they should also enjoy their life. So we have no rights to make this planet a dirty planet, isn't it? It's, we are only here for, for a few years and then the next generation will come. So, so in, in that context, if you look at the earth, uh, like humans on this earth, earth is around 4.6 billion years old. Some of the newer research actually suggests that it is even older than this, but we will not go into that problem. Let's say that is all for our presentation today, let's say it is 4.6 billion years old. And if you take that 4.6 billion years and then you put it on, uh, on a 24 hour scale. So if you put it on a 24 hour scale, a big, why 24 hours? Because there is 24 hours in a day. So it becomes a little bit easier to understand. So if you put it on a 24 hour scale in that scale, one second is actually 52,000 years. So if you start from uh, say it started from midnight and then go all the way around, you see that we don't have first plant life actually comes at 6 PM. So we started at midnight, morning came, the day came, afternoon came at evening, 6 PM is the first plant life. And then we had dinosaurs at around between 9 p.m. and 10 p.m., 21 and 22 hours. And if you look at the humans, they appear at 23, 59, 12. And that's the genus Homo appears. Now, the modern humans, as we are you and we are me, me are today, that has come at 23, 59, 56. So that means what? Only four seconds. And in those four seconds, we have done so much of pollution in the environment. We are using so much of resources and creating so much of waste. Four seconds, like 200,000 years. Slightly more than 200,000 years, we have created a mess of this planet, isn't it? So, and that's, we cannot continue with that business as usual. We have to look at, uh, in terms of trying to, uh, like make, make this world a much better place. See, if you look at the mother earth, we, we recently, we saw this during this COVID pandemic. It, there was a lockdown. We, we all were in, inside our home. Just a tiny virus. That's like, a, if, as a human, we have too much of an ego. But that tiny virus actually destroyed our ego. It, it should, uh, <laughs> that you, if, even if you don't, uh, uh, like a, if you, uh, if, even if the humans don't exist on this planet, the planet will exist. Actually, planet will flourish. So there were species before us. There will be species after us. So that's a big statement, actually, if you think that way. So we are only here temporarily. That could be thousands of years. But that is temporary in the, if you look at the age of, of this particular planet. 
So keeping that in background, what we have done in last several years, especially after the Second World War, we have been producing a lot of waste. Waste is actually a misplaced resource. And that's what we are going to talk about. That's why I said resource recovery. It's not waste management. We are more, nowadays we talk about more about resource recovery rather than focusing on end of pipe approach. We want to have a proactive approach. So this report came from World Bank in 2018, towards the end of 2018, where they have looked at how the waste, what is the waste management scenario as of that particular date and how the things will be by 2050. So it says that world generates around 2 billion tons of municipal solid waste annually. And if you don't take any action, if it's business as usual, we are going to have 3.4 billion tons by 2050. So that's a lot of garbage. And that means a job security for people like me. I call myself a garbologist. So I work with different types of garbage. So as Professor uh, uh, Reddy was giving the intro. So it's, uh, so it's a job security, isn't it? But that we should we should look at that's a, and I try to make a joke there. That should not be the focus. Like we should try to minimize the waste being produced. We should try to do uh, uh, like a recycle it, do the resource recovery and all that. And I'll get in a point in, in few few minutes. I'll get there why we really need to do that. So if you look at this municipal solid waste, I'm just focusing on municipal solid waste. We have other types of waste stream out there, but for this talk, let's focus only on municipal solid waste because that's what you and I produce on a day-to-day -day basis. That's why you and I see on a day-to-day -day basis, especially if you are in India or any developing countries, we have a huge problem in terms of waste management. Even in North America, there are issues of waste management. It's not that there all the problems are fixed there too. So if you look at the garbage, this is a global average figure. Uh, we have metal around 4%. We have glass around 5%. We have plastics is around 12%. And this paper is around 18%, 17, 18%. And the food waste and uh, green waste is around 44%. So if you look at, if you add these all together, 5 plus 4 is 9, 12 plus 9 is 21, 21 plus 17 is 38%. So 38% should be easily recycled. Isn't it? So because individually they do have recycling market, metal can be recycled, glass can be recycled, most of the plastics can be recycled, even six, say 60 to 70% of the plastic can be recycled. And these are all by weight basis. And paper and cardboard can be recycled as well. Food and green waste can be composted, can be anaerobic readily digested and produce resource from there. But why it is not happening? What is the problem? In, a, in the, like in uh, many countries, even if you look at the North America as well, the recycling rate is very low. It's around 23, 24%. So that's a very low recycling rate in US and Canada combined. That's uh, data uh, from there. In some provinces, some states in US, it's even worse than that. So, so what is the problem? What is, what is actually becoming, because everything gets mixed up, especially in developing countries like India, when you mix everything together, it's very difficult to do Basically, you can do nothing with that mixed garbage other than putting them in a sanitary landfill. Uh, probably two weeks ago, Professor Milan Kire was talking about all those landfill leachate recirculation and all that. So we have we can put it in a sanitary landfill. That's the only solution we have. It's a, if it's a totally mixed MSW. Uh, you cannot really do much about with that other than putting a, if there are some technologies out there which claim that things work but many times they are we have seen that it does not work uh, to their uh, to what they claim. Uh, there might be some technology out there, but in general, it is mostly is putting it in a sanitary landfill. But that's not the solution, isn't it? Putting things in sanitary landfill, it is a, like I would not should not say it's not a solution. It definitely is a solution to keep the environmental problems away. It's a, can you can prevent the groundwater pollution. You can prevent the land. You can collect the landfill gas. Landfill gas at around 65 percent. You can probably we can collect because that's uh, that's on a higher side in terms of landfill gas collection efficiency. So we are losing some resource there. We are putting rec recyclables in the landfill. It will degrade, it will produce some methane, but that's not a good use of that. We should try to promote more on resource recovery. And space for landfill, other than big countries, the space of landfill is a problem. In many countries, there is an issue of finding a new site for landfill. Many European countries, they don't want to have a landfill. So landfill, unfortunately, gets a lot of bad name as well, although it's not, uh, it is a, it's a actually considered a, one of the marvels of geo-environmental engineering. And uh, I totally agree with that. It, it's, it requires so much of knowledge to design and operate a landfill. So, 
And if you look at in South Asia, where we are sitting right now, it's 334 million tons. And in North America, 289 million tons. So there is a lot of waste in, going to be produced in the different areas which needs to be managed. So as I said, the problem is mix, mixing of garbage. This piece I wrote uh, almost three years ago in Economic Times, uh, which is on for effective waste disposal segregation is the key. If you can Google it and go to that particular newspaper, there was a big article done with some inputs from our, our side as well on what, to, here it is actually, how to make waste to wealth and reality. So there was a big article done on that and they asked me to write a separate piece on, on uh, segregation, so I wrote that. So there we talk in great detail about why segregation is important, why it is important to in implement that solid waste management rules in India, that wet and dry uh, segregation or similar rules in all over the world, where why it is important. Because as I told you just now, that unless it's, if you are collected separately, unless wet and dry, dry means all the recyclables will be in the dry fraction, we can individually separate it out and make use of that. When, when thing gets mixed together, it's very difficult to any, uh, do anything with that, other than, of course, putting it uh, in the landfill. So then this whole concept of circular economy, it's a new buzzword for last few years, uh, last maybe over a decade now. So what is circular economy? Some of you may be remember knowing, some of you may not be knowing. So I thought I'll put a few slides here just to explain what is circular economy so that later on when we talk about how we are approaching, how we are applying circular economy in waste management, you can understand that. It's essentially looking at moving away from take, make, waste linear model. Right now, what is the model? You go to the mother earth, you mine, get the raw material, you bring it to the metallurgical, like those uh, uh, plants, those uh, ref like refineries, or uh, uh, those uh, uh, where we make the alumina and uh, the aluminum seed, uh, steel, and other stuff. We make variety of products, we use it, dump it into the environment. So waste, that is your linear model. That's like a linear, it's a linear, isn't it? That's why it's a linear model. Circular economy says that Let's try to avoid creating waste and bring those resources back into the economy. So it's actually decoupling economic activity from the consumption of finite resources. That's, and that is requires a whole, basically, a new set of thinking in terms of industry. So the circular economy uh, th thinking in the industry, gradually it is coming. Again, it is uh, leading from Western European countries, but gradually other countries are also trying to catch up and they try to do that, that we actually, we have to go there. Because see, when we talk about all these different materials present into the environment, uh, we have certain, certain elements are considered abundant. But abundant is also, there is a number, isn't it? So if we, the way we are using it, if we keep on using it uh, at that particular rate, we will also run out of that in maybe, maybe 100 years or a few hundred years or so. But there are several rare earth metals. There are several critical metals which are needed for for variety of products that we make. So those critical metals or the rare earth metals, they need to be recovered from the waste stream. Because unless you do that recovery, uh, it becomes uh, it, it, it becomes a problem. Like you, you are you, you cannot really get new material from the mining uh, mined um, uh, like resources of today. Earlier, if you had say if you take hundred tons of raw uh, your ore, you may get one ton. Today, to get one ton, you may have to go for thousand tons of ores. So, a lot of water required in mining, a lot of energy required in mining, a lot of mining overburden. So. See, there is a lot of waste being uh, produced. And that's, that, you know, and then we have so much of waste, we are just putting it into the landfill or those kind of environment and mostly in dump sites, and which is again polluting the environment. So that's what, uh, this, that's what the concept behind applying this circular economy. Let's take the secondary resource and bring, bring, it, bring, bring it back into the economy. So designing out waste and pollution. So if the waste and pollution were never created at the first place, so circular economy, it's time to reveal and design out negative impacts of economic activity. So whether it's a greenhouse gas, hazardous substances, air pollution, water pollution, land pollution. So you can try to avoid that as much as possible. So here, if you take this example from the wastewater treatment plant, you try to do this energy recovery. From this energy, uh, uh, you produce biogas. The biogas can be used for electricity, can go for heat. Then your other material coming out could be used for bioplastic. We can get phosphate, uh, for, uh, phosphorus fertilizer. The, the sludge coming from these and the AD facilities can be used for organic fertilizer. And the clean water can go for irrigation. 
and whatever we do from day to like uh, is the stuff for our houses and all that the waste water goes there so here again trying to minimize waste as much as possible and we we have a concept of zero waste zero waste actually does not literally means zero it means approach towards zero we will never have actually zero zero waste because there will always be some waste which is there which will need a finding uh, like a resting place so there is always a need for sanitary landfill what we have to do is we have to extend the life of the landfill as much as possible by trying to do resource recovery of whatever component we can do resource recovery from a uh, trying to make and of course we have to make the economics work there as well so if if we if we could build an economy that uses things rather than uses them up so that's the concept of circular economy so you try to preserve the value in the form of energy in the material uh should design it for durability reuse remanufacturing recycling so this is what today if you want to buy if you have an old uh, tv uh, your tv goes bad it's much easier to go buy a new tv you don't even have to go anywhere you buy on uh, put it on online shopping it will be delivered at your home in few days and then your old tv uh, is uh, just becomes a junk uh, because it's very difficult to even find a uh, refurbishing uh, place or a, or a repairing center these days especially in big cities even in india so so that's that's why this throw reuse and throw culture uh, that is creating a lot of waste as well so it's a circular system is try to like learn from nature though if you look at the mother nature they work in a circular system so that the natural system always work in a circular way so that's what we want to uh, we can do here is some example for example steel production if you look at the by product from the slag they make the cement fertilizer dust goes to zinc zinc and iron process gas can be used for electricity or heating there could be other by products made so there are there is a way to make things all thing is that we have to go out of our comfort zone and let it uh, and uh, we have to look at uh, from that perspective so if we could not only protect but actually actually improve the environment from the waste if we can produce biogas if produce green fuel produce by uh, like electricity waste bio refinery recycle and use the management hierarchy properly where where we say reduce reuse recycle do that way rather than putting more and more waste just into the environment and try to get away from fossil fuel more on renewable energy fuel see we are talking about going to this uh, electric car electric vehicle like in india we are talking so much on electric vehicle these days electric vehicle with the present electric present energy mix actually may not be that much of good uh, if you do an lca or if you do the life cycle assessment on that you will get uh, that uh, that actually electric vehicle if you go with the present energy mix is not that much of an improvement because we are using so much of coal based thermal power plant so we have to look at uh, like we have to get away from fossil fuel then if you have more and more renewable energy that's where it will be, make more sense for renewable energy as well you have to look at for example solar power now solar panels after uh, after the end of life of solar panels what will happen to it uh, how to recycle those solar panel how to do the resource recovery of those heavy metals present in the solar panel if it ends up in the dump sites in india or in any developing countries or any place in the world so what what kind of leaching could be there so all those are research questions as well for the students who are out here if you want to do phd in these areas do contact us we will be happy so how this whole concept of origin of circular economy started was a swiss architect uh, he was uh, he was looking at all this packaging and other stuff and all the waste that is produced in a building system and then he said that we have to shift we have we have to shift to a system where we we design out waste and pollution we cannot keep on producing pollu uh, creating pollution the way we have been doing and then it's a big way you, if you have looked at circular economy even on once you must have seen this diagram this is from ellen macarthur foundation all of the students or whoever is in the audience if you are interested in circular economy this is one place you should definitely go because they have a wonderful resource uh, to for you to learn about circular economy in fact there is a mooc course on circular economy uh, on edx as well uh, on procera or edx it is there uh, we are trying to develop one from india too we'll see if we can uh, be able to do that so as you can see here it talks about biological cycle as well as technical cycle biological cycle where you take the anything which is biodegradable you collect it you take extract the biochemical feedstock you do anaerobic digestion you produce biogas and then you put it in the biosphere your sludge and other stuff which goes there it uses for farming so 
we we are trying to use all the resources back rather than putting it in a dump site where it rots and my methane is produced and goes into the atmosphere and creates those uh, uh, global warming uh, potentials and all that similarly for technical cycles it uh, you try to recycle refurbish reuse remanufacture maintenance so that's the it they talk about that this is the basic diagram of this uh, circular economy systems diagram which you will find in most of the most of the documents related to circular economy this diagram will be there so decoupling natural resources use an environmental impact there are some examples uh, have already happening japan reduced its material consumption uh, in 2010 down to the level of 1970 so in 2010 they they had that material consumption what they had in 1970 so that's like absolute decoupling decoupling mexico city is working on that as well recycling global annual turnover exceeds uh, 160 billion us dollar and processes more than 600 million tons of commodities annual, annually and produces a lot of secondary production uh, material secondary material so these things are already happening uh, right now so presently uh, in uh, by say if you look at 2050 we will be using 140 billion tons of resource uh, that will be used uh, demand for resources now 1900 it was 7 billion tons 2005 it was 60 billion tons in the present rate 2050 from 2005 to 2050 in 45 years will it will become actually two two and half times so growing population uh, economic development increasing consumption growing consum consumption pattern use and throw so uh, all those are like uh, lots and lots of resources are needed so if you don't if you don't if you follow the usual pattern will having uh, increase in resource extraction increase in greenhouse gas emission resource scarcity land degradation water pollution loss of biodiversity air pollution see we cannot we talk about economy all the time you cannot have healthy economy without having healthy workforce if you and i are sick and if i have a lot of money in my bank what so that so what so it's uh, i can get the medicines i can buy the medicines but if i cannot enjoy the life what is the point of having those money so it, having good economy is very very important but having a healthy workforce is more important because if your workforce is important then only you will have a healthy economy because then the problem will people will be uh, like uh, efficient they will do the work for us they will work, do the work and then the, they will produce healthy economy we are becoming more and more urban uh, 60% of india's population will live in urban areas 70% of the building that will exist in india is yet to be constructed so so that why these i'm talking about all these that means lots and lots of resources are needed in country like india so and we have the sustainable development goals where we have to have clean water and sanitation we talk about good health we talk about uh, uh, like a life uh, life on land we talk about climate we talk about responsible consumption so there are several uh, sustainable development goals which links to this having proper waste management proper resource extraction this diagram was uh, actually it was in the indian resource panel which was done in 2015 where they found that how we how the uh, in india the demand for resources will be so if you look at uh, uh, up to 20 2010 it is the actual data and this is the projected data so if you look at say 2030 for now or 2050 for let's look at 2050 we will seeing that more metals more fossil fuel more non metal uh, non metal minerals more biomass so every for everything we need more and more resources and we cannot just go to mother earth and get those resources so we have to look at secondary resources secondary resource secondary materials are needed so the use of secondary materials are inevitable to meet both growing demands as well as supply constraint so that kind of gives us are uh, the incentive to look for resource recovery from waste material and from the variety of waste material today i'm focusing on municipal solid waste but then we can talk about for other industrial waste mining waste and so on and so forth uh, if uh, look, if you look at the urbanization in india the, we had the last two census in 2001 and 2011 uh, next census is going to happen uh, in 2021 which is now uh, it may probably get delayed a little bit because of covid but uh, maybe later this year we'll have the data or early next year uh, we'll have those information so as you can see here different colors i'll not to spend too much time here the yellow is the least uh, urbanization the red is the most and you can see that uh, many states have changed color many states are becoming more and more urban 
more and more urban means more and more uh, demand for resources, more and more waste production as well, and then uh, a lot of demand, a lot of uh, stress on urban local bodies in terms of managing the waste, providing clean water, providing uh, proper sanitation, wastewater treatment, wastewater systems, and all. Uh, this is the government data. Actual data is actually quite be much higher. This is the CPCB 2015 uh, report. Now it is almost seven years old. Uh, but uh, we are since I just go by the government figure. So it is 62 million tons annually. Out of all that, 70% gets collected, and out of seven, out of that which is collected, only nearly 25% is treated. Rest 75% of the collected waste is just going into online landfill. We had several composting plant, biomethanation plant, RDFs, and waste to energy plants, and uh, some of them are also struggling. We'll talk about that in a minute. Why why they are struggling, and uh, so it is it is becoming an issue. Uh, so in terms of you look at the waste management in India, we started long back. Uh, the first uh, uh, record which shows up is uh, the composting of solid waste. Ministry of Agriculture gave loans for composting of solid waste in 1960. And since then, we have been doing something or the other. But for municipal solid waste, the Surat plague was one of the trigger point where uh, Surat plague actually raised a lot of awareness about having proper uh, municipal solid waste management. Then we have these committees there. And then we had this municipal solid waste uh, rules, MSW rules 2000. And then there was a CPHO manual associated with that, that manual uh, to go along with this, basically to, uh, like if you, in North America, we have those RECRA manuals, so which kind of goes in detail about how those rules can be implemented. So then uh, later on in uh, 2016, all these rules got revised. In between, we have a lot of other rules came for different types of waste, and this got revised. They got more streamlined. In 2018, e-waste got even further revised. 2015, we had the CND rules first came. We had this uh, uh, national action plan. We have uh, Swachh Bharat Mission. We have National Green Tribunal. So a lot of, uh, in terms of regulation, a lot of things have happened. But it's still, uh, in terms of getting these rules implemented is becoming a problem. So where we are lacking in developing countries specifically and also in developed countries, pockets of developed countries, and I would talk about India in particular, uh, since I've been, uh, as Professor Reddy said, I've been trying to work with several proposed smart cities in India. Uh, so whenever you go for these integrated waste management plan, you have to take a scientific approach. And that, that science and policy has to meet together. And that's where we are. We have actually we we are lacking, and that's uh, uh, many of you will agree with that. That we, science and policy, like for most many times, we see that actually it is not. Uh, it's meeting together, and it's creating a lot of problem. So how to go about doing a integrated waste management plan? Say for any city to start with, first of all, of course, you need to know what you want. What is the need? Identify your need. What type of waste are currently generated, and in what quantities? Because you need to know, I, I say that, uh, say, if you go to a doctor and the doctor, you are, I'm, I'm sick, I'm sick with some, with some serious disease and I go to the doctor and doctor doesn't do any diagnosis and he writes the prescription. I will be really worried worry about that prescription because no diagnosis was done. Unfortunately, that is how the waste management is happening in the country for many, almost two decades, two and a half decades. People go to consulting firms and they write the prescription. They have, right, they have no idea of what is the, how much waste is there, what is, how, what is there in the garbage, because what is produced at our home and what is, what is ending up in the waste disposal system is way different. Our collection system is not secure. What you produce at home, so if you, if you go and take the sample from individual houses, that waste goes to a primary collection center. The primary collection center is out in the open on the side of the road. You have the goats, you have uh, dogs, you have cows eating a lot of stuff from there. You have rack pickers and others taking all the recyclables from there. Now you went to the secondary collection. Again, some of those things gone. And then finally you went to the dump site or waste to energy plant or composting plant. And then uh, well, along the way, since the collection is not that proper, you lose some, uh, some of some already got degraded. Now you designed your system based on very limited samples collected from individual homes. 
some hig high income group low income group medium income group some uh, like high uh, high income area some uh, slum area and you got some data and you did that but that's not is what the garbage is coming because the collection system is not like that that everything will come there so if you design your plant in that way of course it will fail isn't it that's the reason why the things fail so we have to really have do the blood test urine test of this garbage uh, that's what I'm trying to say. That you have to have a very good understanding of what is there in the garbage. People say it will it will require a lot of money. Ah, uh, yes, it will. But if the plant fails, which they are, you are actually losing more money there. So that we have to do the things properly. In Hindi, people say, uh, like those of you who understand Hindi, we uh, in uh, it is said that jaldi karo, jald baji mat karo. That uh, do it uh, quickly, but don't do it in haste. Don't take decision in haste. Have a proper understanding of the problem. So that is needed. That's the need. What type of waste is there? What in what quantity is there? Then you review your existing system. What is present? Uh, like how to if can we salvage something from the present? How to get these rack pickers or waste uh, waste pickers incorporated into formal system? Review the regulation. You make your org decision making framework. You establish your objective. And here as well. It, it becomes more of a site specific. Say it cannot be one size fit all for entire country like India. Because what will work, say for example, waste to energy plant in a high rainfall area with so much of moisture in the garbage, waste to energy is not going to work. We know that. So we cannot say that waste to energy can work in, in a higher, uh, and then, but in a dry climate, in a very dry states. Yes, it is possible as long as the calorific value is good, as long as you don't mix your uh, bricks and uh, soil and other things with it, which reduces the calorific value. So you need to have your objective or identify potential components. You compare your options. And when you compare option, try to have the thinking of life cycle there. Don't have a silos approach, have a systems approach. And I'll show you in next slide how we do that. And uh, develop an integrated waste management plan. You implement the plan and then you evaluate the waste management plan. So usually the, these plans are done for 25 years, but then you every five years you should come back and revisit that plan and look at what is working, what is not working, why it is not working, what went wrong and how to fix it. And for all these, we need to have public participation. We need to do outreach. We need to have education. And we need to have each and every stakeholders on that table. You need to get industry folks on the table too, because they are the people who will make, the, make it happen. So we cannot make rule which cannot be implemented. See, even making a tough rule, but if cannot be implemented, there is no point making those rules, isn't it? So, it's, uh, that's, uh, so we have to realize that. And that's a big uh, miss that we are having in many of these developing countries. So in terms of life cycle, you start looking at from uh, the entire approach, uh, from your, what is your goal and scope? Are you looking at for your entire uh, waste management, whether to go for anaerobic digestion or composting, or if you want to go for waste to energy plants, whether you have enough calorific value, whether you go for a landfill, land engineered landfill with gas recovery, engineered landfill without gas recovery. So you kind of line up all those different options. And then you do this life cycle assessment for entire from generation, storage, collection, transfer and transport processing, and then finally to disposal and treatment. And then you look at uh, where you are getting the best, best uh, your uh, benefit for the environment. And you choose that. And of course, you have to look at the economics. So you have to do the life cycle costing as well. So looking at the environmental footprint as well as the economic aspect and operational issues. So environment, economics, and operational. Taking all these three together, that's we have to make the decision. So that's how we have to have a systems approach in uh, doing this uh, kind of uh, uh, solution. So once you have uh, gone through that, you have different technologies out there. Uh, another thing we say that whenever you talk to some ULB, they will ask, do you have any new technology? Are you new? There are lots of technology already present, but we are not even being able to implement the simple technology on the ground because we are not operating it properly. The problem is not the technology. Problem is that we are not doing proper homework in getting those technologies implemented. So 
for if you for uh, for your organic fraction you can go for composting anaerobic digestion for thermal conversion there is a incineration gasification pyrolysis these gasification pyrolysis is usually done for a specialized waste not for uh, uh, municipal solid waste that much uh, but incineration mass burn or refused derived fuel anaerobic digestion for organic fraction like biodegradable or composting those things can uh, does uh, uh, make sense and you look at the what what kind of uh, market you have say if you produce compost there is no market for compost there is no point going to go, uh, going uh, for compost you do anaerobic digestion for that and um, because you will make those biomethane and you can use those so if you don't make those decision properly what happens what we are, you are seeing in this graph here this is from 2018 uh, from to burn or not to burn uh, this is done by uh, ss uh, sambial so swati singh sambial and richa uh, they have done this uh, small uh, report and as you can see there are in a 69 megawatt operational plant in terms of waste to energy 84 megawatt under construction 382 under uh, proposed and then 66 non functional now we are having this proposed i am really afraid that if we do business as usual if we don't act soon we may get uh, this graph kind of catching up with this because if why those are non functional we have to really understand what why it went why it did not work and how we expect that un unless we change our collection system unless we change our uh, the way we are handling the garbage how it will stop to work, how it will suddenly it will start working it will not work there is no magic isn't it so we have to learn from those failures uh, so that we can we should not make those mistakes so so that's uh, I'm, i'm i'm see each and every technology can be used but you, we have to make sure whether it is used it is really usable is whether it is really useful uh, in that contest so now i'll talk about one uh, ex example from our lab which we have been working on in recent times uh, you know on hydrothermal carbonization which is on kind of circular economy concept it is uh, it's because as i said waste to energy having as you saw just uh, before uh, being too much of moisture the calorific value is low and with all these inert material also calorific value goes down but moisture creates a lot of problem in uh, especially in indian contest for many states where we have too much of rainfall like a good amount of rainfall so we thought that can we use this htc process hydrothermal carbonization process along with anaerobic digestion and uh, doing some pre treatment to the lignocellulosic biomass to increase the biomass to increase the methane production as well so if we can do that uh, so that's what we were, we wanted to test it out so htc is actually trying to mimic the natural qualification process so we are working with high pressure and uh, it's a, it's mixed with water and heated in a closed reactor which is like a pressure cooker so in this study we looked at this yard waste and later on we used food waste as well so first since there is a lignocellulosic biomass there is a lignin so we start we did some pre treatment to break those lignin then we did anaerobic digestion produced biogas and the sludge which came out we did the hydrothermal carbonization and produced hydrochar and try to minimize the waste as much as possible but for this as well you need source segregated garbage it cannot work on mixed garbage so as i said in that economic times piece you need source segregated waste later on we also used uh, food waste mixed yard waste and food waste together and uh, we produced this biogas we looked at the the energy balance we as per uh, uh, for we looked at some of this kinetic model as well and try to uh, like look at uh, based on different treatment system which model works good how to predict how much how much gas will be produced and um, this was uh, uh, in terms of uh, this this is a smaller reactor later on we used the bigger reactor as well and uh, temperature was around 200 degree centigrade 6 uh, hours uh, solid to liquid ratio was 1 is to 4 and uh, pre treatment was done using uh, uh, your oven or uh, your hot water and uh, uh, like uh, 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 microwave or sony sonicator so different pre treatment method was used to break down those lignin and that helped into producing uh, more uh, methane uh, when we do research we looked at uh, the mechanism we try to understand what is happening with uh, different uh, things uh, which we are uh, trying to understand so we do all these sem and all those images to try to see uh, where uh, what are the different uh, uh, like structures how the structures are changing what are the ftir will give you all these bonds functional group which actually give, makes you understand better in terms of mechanism so i'll not go in those detail if you are interested you can always send me an email i will more than happy to share those papers which we have uh, already published in these areas and we can talk about that as well so in terms of uh, results and discussion if you can go because in interest of time i'll go there a little bit quicker so we uh, produced uh, uh, of course with uh, pre treatment the uh, 
we our gas production was more and with we also worked at different food and my food and uh, mass ratio like food and micro ratio this graph is important so because this gives us in terms of big picture so here the yellow bar is your input energy which will be in negative how much energy we are putting into the system uh, green is your output energy how much energy is coming out of the system and this uh, hash uh, light green with hash is your net energy gain so as you can see for different food microbe ratio uh, we had net energy gain in uh, each of those scenarios so we we do produce energy from those so other if you're if this becomes negative if you are actually having more input energy less output energy of course that technology we can we can uh, uh, publish a paper or two but uh, that will not go that that technology cannot go anywhere and we did find uh, uh, that uh, hydrochar which was produced uh, uh, did had slight increase in uh, in the calorific value but in terms of calorific value not that much of an increase but that uh, hydrochar uh, if you look at um, your uh, hydrochar stability it found out that uh, uh, the pretreated one were stable for a longer period of time and that hydrochar produced was compared to lignite lignite and peat uh, in terms of calorific value uh, so it can replace coal at uh, different uh, 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 like applications. So rather than using fossil fuel, we can use this. So here we saw that uh, STC uh, saw an increase in 21% of carbon content uh, as compared to 17%. TGA analysis showed that hydrochar prepared actually were more thermally stable as compared to the untreated yard waste. So digested hydrochar. Overall, uh, we, it was saw that uh, you can do uh, it, uh, doing a pre-treatment improves biogas production, but also improves better quality hydrochar. Uh, so in line of circular economy, resource recovery, uh, uh, using anaerobic digestion coupled with hydrothermal carbonization actually presents us as a unique uh, new opportunity. So then we move to the bigger reactor as well. So we have done some work with the bigger reactor now, uh, where uh, this, you saw the smaller reactor first. Now we have a bigger reactor. And presently, we are trying to uh, build a uh, uh, like a pilot plant on this uh, as well. So this uh, fuel pallets, and we even treated this, uh, we made this. Uh, uh, palletization. So uh, this palletization can be done. These pallets can be used for a longer period of time. We can use it. Self life can be improved, and uh, it can be sold to different uh, agencies where they can use it as a fuel source. And presently, as part of a PhD student of uh, one of my student, uh, Hari Bhakt Sarma, uh, he is uh, working on uh, on this particular topic. We are looking at uh, in terms of the big picture. Uh, as Professor Reddy was mentioning that we always try to look at the big picture in terms of uh, all those is work that we are doing in, uh, in terms of developing this particular aspect uh, of hydrothermal carbonization for organic fraction of municipal solid waste, how it fits in the big picture from a social point of view, from an economic point of view, from an environmental benefits. So what is known as the pestle analysis, we are trying to do that. And we are also looking at the li life cycle assessment. So this will uh, try to look at uh, uh, jobs as well as uh, looking at greenhouse gas emission reduction, market, renewable energy, climate change, SDG contributions. Uh, so all those things uh, uh, will be uh, like being explored. Uh, you will see, very soon you will see some papers from that as well. So that hydrochar produced was actually taken even further. And uh, I saw that a student who worked on it uh, from NIT Warangal, uh, he is uh, in the audience. Uh, uh, in the, I saw his video was on in the beginning, uh, Sai Krishna Veena. So he worked on taking this hydrochar and then making it uh, as an energy storage material. So as an energy storage material. So see, think about that food waste or the organic waste that you are wasting today. Maybe two years down the line, you have that uh, part of the battery in your cell phone. That would be really cool, isn't it? And if we can do those kind of uh, uh, beneficial reuse, if they, we can do those, uh, uh, we can say value added products, that will make this proposition attractive for more and more companies to come and work in this particular area. So that's what uh, uh, this, uh, uh, that paper is will be out very soon. Uh, Sai Krishna is there, it's a pressure on him to <laughs> get it drafted now. So I already announced it to a big audience. So it's, uh, so we are, um, so that, that will be really uh, nice. We are also looking at the use of soil amendment, use, of course, fuel, uh, activated carbon, carbon black, and all that. So very quickly, I'll skip these now. These are uh, some of the work that uh, which we got published. Uh, there are several other papers. I just put some examples here in very good journals. And it got a lot of uh, media coverage uh, in uh, of uh, different newspapers and others. It came, uh, we were uh, interviewed for some places uh, too. 
Uh, we are doing some lot of other works in our lab. Uh, I'm try trying to kind of wrap up in next five, six minutes so that we have some time for questions. So in terms of, um, we are doing some work on electrochemical oxidation of leachate. Uh, this is uh, Pubali is working on that. Then uh, Sagrika just recently finished. She's working on organic waste to biogas. That's what her project. Then her, like uh, Ajit uh, Amit Jaglan is uh, trying to do how to have better waste management at university campuses. And uh, we are hurry, like uh, we have a student working on a smart sustainable waste management, fuel from plastic and biomass, nanoparticles for remediation. So this I just wanted to give you some idea about different work that we are trying to do. Uh, so that if any one of you are interested to work on these areas, you are more than welcome to contact us. I will be happy. So as uh, Professor Reddy was mentioning in uh, recent times, I'm doing some work on plastics. So I thought I'll just talk very briefly about uh, uh, the involvement of plastic that we have been working with National Geographic. We are trying to look at uh, plastic from sea to source. As you can see that there are a lot of work, a lot of media on ocean cleanup. Then there is a lot of uh, uh, attention on river cleanup as well. But there is no attention, uh, there's, there is not as much attention in terms of let's stop it from the happening at the first place. So what is, why it is happening? Why these plastics are ending up in these rivers and finally to ocean? It is because of the mismanagement of municipal solid waste. Because the municipal solid waste is not being managed properly along those rivers or along the, and then so this mismanaged leads to leakages of this plastic waste and that gets into the river and then finally to the ocean. So that's what being a waste management research team, we have been working on that. So try to understand, again, try to understand how much plastic is there, what type of plastic is there, and how to prevent it from reaching the river. So that was the my, my part of the work. This project was multidisciplinary and all that, but this was what uh, IIT Kharagpur was uh, involved in that. And we worked from all the way from the top, from Harsil uh, to, uh, uh, to, uh, like, uh, to Bay of Bengal. And we have done sampling at different places. We uh, met people, we talked to people, we looked at the rack pickers, and the report is already out there. So if you go to the National Geographic website, you will find the summary report, a very brief summary report they have put. They did not put the very detailed technical report because that gets boring. So if they put a summary report for more for a policymakers, but detailed report is also will be available soon. So. So we went all around. Uh, so we the students, uh, they went around and they did all that. Uh, this was uh, the research uh, team, as you can see, mostly led by uh, ladies. Uh, which uh, it was a uh, two uh, leaders of these teams were these two uh, ladies, Jenna Jambak and Heather uh, from UK. Heather from UK, Jenna is from University of Georgia, a very long friend of my, very old friend of mine. And uh, here is uh, my student Gaurav uh, who worked on this project and then Avinash, uh, they worked on uh, this project. And I, I'm a bit dressed up too much because I had a meeting after this at IIT Roorkee. So that's why you see me dressed up a quite a, uh, compared to other, I'm, uh, that I'm looking an odd man out. So, but any, so this was the team we worked uh, along uh, the river, the World uh, Wildlife Institute were involved, people from Bangladesh were involved, uh, several organizations, uh, other organizations from US and UK were all, also involved on that. Then I'm also working with World Resource Institute on uh, as a high level panel for sustainable ocean economy, which is a unique initiative of 14 world leaders. Uh, they are working on uh, uh, trying to prevent this ocean pollution. So. This was our task uh, to come up with strategies to address plastic pollution in the context of already stretched ocean. Again, this report is out there. If you are interested, uh, you will find it. If you don't, just send me an email. I'll send you that. Uh, this was we were the lead authors on this blue paper. Blue paper. Jenna was just, uh, Jenna is uh, Jenna Ellie Mosh is an independent consultant in US and myself, and we had uh, lead authors from pretty much all around the world. So. Just a very summary of that report, uh, what, we, what was the findings? So five to 13 million metric tons of plastic go into the ocean each year. That is equivalent to one dump truck of plastic per minute going into the ocean. 13 billion per year in damage to marine environment. 3% of ocean plastic is floating. 97% actually goes, into, goes below the surface and finally to the sediments. 1.9 million microplastics per square meter on the ocean floor. Actually, by 2050, we'll have more pieces of plastic in ocean than the fish. So if you love seafood, you are actually, you, you may lose your seafood. 
but it's not only plastic plastic unfortunately gets a lot of bad press a lot of bad name see it is as i tried to say earlier as well plastic as a material is not that much of a problem it is the plastic waste which is a problem mismanagement of plastic waste is a problem but there are other sources of waste as well which goes into the ocean in terms of industry pharmaceuticals sewage treatment plants crop as animal agriculture and uh, solid waste dumping atmospheric deposition and a lot of things happening in the ocean itself which leads to uh, having uh, uh, pollution into the ocean so how to prevent that so we looked at some of these sectors like what are the municipal sectors agriculture and aquaculture industrial maritime all those different sectors we looked at the types of pollutants macroplastic microplastics other plastics like new antibiotics heavy metals industrial oil and gas so this was more of kind of looking at a uh, you can say that it's a big review paper of 60 65 pages uh, printed 60 65 printed pages so it was a uh, like a maybe a state of what is the present state of knowledge in terms of this we looked at the ocean uh, species what is the impact on the ocean uh, health of uh, uh, like a, uh, health uh, in of, the, of uh, species present in ocean or also like a human health impact and economical impact as well so then we come up with a solution so how to how like how what needs to be done in terms of and then broadly how like improve wastewater man treatment improve the storm water adopt green chemistry practical resource efficiency recover recycle improve coastal zones build local systems and then we go in great detail about that and we relate it to different sdg goals as well uh, so in terms of all these how it will help in several of those sdg goals uh, which we need to achieve by 2030 and it was reported this work has been uh, reported in many media houses uh, this is uh, from guardian uh, this where they talk about uh, how to uh, like improve uh, our plastic uh, plastic pollution situation in the ocean so that's what kind of uh, big picture what we have been uh, uh, some uh, snapshot of what we have been doing uh, this is uh, where uh, my research is uh, my research group is working right now and we are looking at in near future looking at organic fraction of municipal solid waste and try to do a lot of resource recovery and circular economy approaches there in terms of well generating value added products so if you are interested in any of those areas uh, feel free uh, to let us know uh, in recent uh, times we also did some work on uh, uh, looking at covid impact on waste management some of you may have seen those papers so covid impact on uh, looking at solid waste as well as covid impact on plastic waste so and then uh, we are working some more on this aspect right now so my take home message for you that whenever you look at a solution have a systems approach have a kind of circular economy thinking have uh, 